The largemouth bass is one of the most adaptable of all of our freshwater game fish. Through massive stocking programs initiated in the late 1800s and continuing through the present, black bass are now available to anglers in 49 states, eight Canadian provinces, Mexico, Central and South America, Europe, Africa, and Japan. Though the largemouth bass is a hardy and versatile fish which can reproduce and flourish in diverse habitats, the best bass waters seem to have one common ingredient, weeds. Aquatic grasses come in numerous forms, from emergent vegetation such as bulrushes, cattails, and lily pad fields, to subsurface forests of cabbage, coontail, hydrilla, and milfoil. Whatever the case, bass simply thrive in waters where weeds are plentiful. How much vegetation is too much? Research has shown that reservoirs with about 30% weed cover produce more bass than reservoirs where weeds are scarce or overabundant. In today's Bass in the Grass program, the Yin Fisherman staff explores a variety of highly effective techniques developed to find and catch bass out of weeds. We'll cover bass buzzing, slow rolling spinner baits, frog bait bass, rip cranking, topwater tactics, and methods for dealing with those pesky cold fronts. In short, we're focusing on the techniques and patterns that will make you a grass master. Roar. Bass in the shallow slop, one of the most challenging environments an angler will ever encounter. Slow going, push poles and clogged trolling motors are the rule in this game. But the rules are changing. Let's join in fisherman founder Al Lindner, along with his son Troy, as they ply the skinny water. <laughs> oh, get out of there. Come on, baby. Oh, man. She's a big one. She's a big one, Troy. Whew. Oh, boy. Mouthful of pads and all. Yeah, come on up here. <laughs> Look at that, huh? Oh, that's a good looking, good looking bass. Let me let me clean off a couple pounds of of junk off her boy. She hooked right in the top of her nose. Perfect. Perfect. Hook up. Good looking fish. Kind of fish you can tell by the color she's been living up in this the shallow water junk for a long, long, long time. You know, anytime you got bass like this and lots and lots of shallow overhead weed cover like this, they go hand in hand. Bass are in this kind of stuff all year long, and in some cases, they're the biggest bass in the system. I thought you were bigger than that. Where else were you? Caused a big commotion for a little fish. Big commotion. You know, we're we're throwing mainly, mainly these hollowed, hollow baited frog type baits, which work really good in dense cover. But depending on the cover situations you're faced with, there's a variety of different kind of baits that you could try in situations like this. In heavy cover, plastic frog type baits are a mainstay in the arsenal of slop bass anglers because frogs are a staple in the diets of bass north and south. But other baits can be effective. In less dense cover, lures such as the Rapala minnow spoon can be skittered across the surface and allowed to sink in subsurface presentations. A little hint, add a plastic skirt or a pork trailer for that extra wiggle that drives fish crazy. Grab that thing like. Stop, stop it, man. There he is. Boy, yeah, I hardly, barely made a sound when he grabbed that. Ah, right through the snow. Get that out of here, there, buddy. Little guy. Another real dark fish. Like the, the other ones we've had. Here you go, little fella. Got him. Oh, get him. Right up. Come on out of there, baby. <laughs> Strictly manhandling him. 
Look at, look at it's a nice one too, boy. I tell you one thing about coming in into the shallow water stuff like this, you gotta have the right equipment. The biggest mistake a lot of people make when they come in to fish this junk is coming in with too light of stuff. This is not definitely not a finesse bite. I got a quantum heavy action six and a half foot rod, 20 pound test XT bait casting. Uh, in a lot of cases, you might go as heavy as 30 pound test line and uh, uh, seven and a half foot rod. Say you're fishing a slop like this down in Florida or Louisiana or someplace where you got a shot at catching, you know, maybe a, a, an eight or 10 pound fish. Up north here in the water we're in, the best I can expect on this particular lake may be a six pounder. So I'm fine with 20 pound testing this kind of equipment. But the key is heavy duty, not lightweight stuff. Oh, there he is. Ah. Oh, I got him. Got him? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> I love it. <sighs> this guy isn't burying me like the last one. No. There you are. Nice. There. That's that's what I'm talking about. More of the likings of that. Nice fish. You know, you get in an area like this, you stop the boat and you sit for a long time. You get in an area where you hit a fish, you fan cast all around you. Fish can come out of anything. Naturally, there's high percentage pockets and holes that you make each cast, you try to line up a cast so that you can come through as many open pockets you know, as you possibly can and that, that ups your odds. But you could sit in one area and spend 15 minutes throwing all around and when you catch a bass, that's what you want to do because there's usually more than one fish in that immediate, immediate area. Good areas are good areas even though they look all the same for certain sections that you could get in and you could catch six, eight, ten fish in one area and then you can fish, you know, two more acres of stuff that looks just like it and catch zip. So when you get a fish, stop and work that whole area. There's more than one in there, that's for sure. Fish living in huge bass pastures can be difficult to pinpoint, but there are some things you can do to put the odds in your favor. Bass love edges. To eliminate water, concentrate on the corridors existing 20 feet or so either side of the edges created by changes in vegetation, the shoreline, the outside weed edge, or clear pockets in otherwise heavy cover. Active fish will work these zones, and if you get in a zone, you'll get bit big time. Oh! Oh! Come on out of there! Come on out of there! That's a nice one here, Troy. That's a good bass. Come on out of that stuff, baby. Come here. Come here, mama. Oops. That baby, huh? Oh, yes. There is something magic about that. That slurp, I tell you. I love it. You hear it, they just go. <laughs> I'm gonna get that one next summer. Hopefully after I graduate. You know, it wasn't that many years ago that for me to be able to come up in acres and acres of shallow water slop cover like this and fish for bass, I had to use a push pole, and I did that for a long, long time. And it worked, but boy, it was a pain. It was a real aggravation. The advan advancements in today's trolling motors is absolutely incredible. This particular unit has 101 pounds of thrust. You heard me, 101 pounds of thrust. It's a 36 volt system. I can fish all day long in heavy cover like this, never run my battery down, and pull through the heaviest of junk. It's absolutely incredible. And you, you think this is incredible, take a look at this thing. These high powered bow mount trolling motors are only the beginning. Minn Kota is coming out with a fully automated front troll motor. The Genesis motor will revolutionize shallow water fishing and any fishing that calls for power and efficiency, this troll deploys at the touch of a foot switch. It's less likely to disturb fish, and it's easier on the body. Likewise, the Genesis also stows at the touch of the switch. If you want to change the depth of the propeller, there's a power trim feature. Hey, no more bending over to loosen the shaft. 
A digital display gives you accurate battery readings, eliminating any guesswork. This new motor also integrates the hands-free Minn Kota Autopilot feature that steers your boat in a straight line while you keep fishing. Hey, I'm really looking forward to fishing with the Genesis. It's what I've been looking for for a long, long time. Oh, come on, baby. Oh, come on, baby. Oh, come on, baby. Oh, come on, baby. Oh, boy, I'll tell you what. For a North Country bass, a fish like that, for way up here, is considered a real nice bass in anybody's books. And a lot of bodies of water like this, these shallow water weed choked areas, this is the kind of fishing you can experience if you pick the right time. You match your weather conditions to take advantage of the bite, and you can have some great bass fishing. In shallow water, fishing like this with these kind of baits, about as good as it can get. Right, kiddo? Understanding weed composition is a vitally important facet when it comes to mastering any grass fishing situation. All weed beds have distinct edges that concentrate bass and other fish that live in and around them. Basically, weed beds are formed with a deep outside edge, an inside shallow edge, and the flats in between. Changes in bottom and weed types also form natural underwater corridors where fish seek safety and find food. Generally, active fish tend to move out to the edges or over the tops of weeds, while inactive fish tend to hold tightly in thick clumps. When it comes to fishing big bass, many lures have seasonal windows when they're the best option. Spinner baits tend to shine in the cool water periods in spring and fall. Crank baits are a good choice during the warm water months. Buzz baits? Well, let's see what Dan Sura and Al Lindner have to say. Whoa! Whoa! whoa. Yeah, Got him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good fish. Big fish. Big bass. Yep. Oh. Ooh, ho, ho. Yeah. You heard her gobble, huh? Woo. Yep. I'm jealous. That's the right kind of sound. When you hear that on a buzz bait, it gets your heart going. Whoosh. Whoosh. I knew that would get your attention, Dan. I knew that would get your attention. And she's on. She's got the, the trailer hook. Hey, I'll tell you something. When bass. Like this baby, I run a buzz bait bite like this. Fishing, I guess you could say it's explosive. <laughs> it's gonna be a good day, Dan. You see how dark they are? They're real pretty bass. Water should be in the 60s here, low 60s, I would think. Get him. There he is. Good one. Good one. Uh, Looks like a good I, I, bass. I'm gonna get him up. Nice bass. <sighs> On that edge. Yeah. Not exactly the biggest fish in the lake, Al, but it's a start. You'll notice we've got a stinger hook set up. A lot of times that'll make the difference between getting bit and not getting bit when it comes to buzz baiting. The fish comes up and just makes a pass at the bait, you can get them in the snoot. But other times they'll come up and they'll smash it and take the whole thing in. Just depends on their activity level. Got him. Got him? Yeah. There's something magic about that sound. <laughs> Come on here, baby. Come on, baby. Pinned him with the, the trailer hook on one spot. There. And in his mouth. Got him there. Huh? Not a bad fish. Overall. You know, buzz baits like this actually produce bass all year long. But the best time to fish these things, no matter if you're on a lake like we're on now or fishing a reservoir, 
is in late summer, early fall. You can see the trees are just turning behind us. It's a nice, warm, early fall day. And that's another key thing. They like to come up on these buzzbait bites at this time of the year. What happens, you've got a whole lot of these fish come back up shallow. And I really believe a lot of the fish that have been shallow tend to come out a little bit more. And the area in between, I guess you'd call it the flats, which is ideal buzzbait water, really draws a lot of fish. So I actually fall fishing, whether you're in reservoirs when the shad come back up or in areas like we're fishing, which is mainly a bluegill base. If I had to pick one time of the year to buzzbait fish, this is it. And that period of time is pretty long depending on where you live in the country. You know, way up north here, we're dealing with probably outside end six weeks where we can get a pretty good bite like this. And the further south you go, you know, where you're at, it might be two and a half months that a buzzbait would shine. Fun way to fish. Pay point. Oh, that's a better help. Yeah. Yeah. Toe to toe action. <laughs> <laughs> that's the closest thing to musky fishing I can find is catching bass on buzzbaits. Oh. Come here. Hookup too. Nice there. Yeah, that's better. We well, gobbled that thing, Dan. When you're going toe to toe with big bass like this and cover like that, you better be set up with the right equipment. And generally speaking, we like to use six and a half to seven and a half foot medium heavy action quantum tour edition bait casting outfits. So you can really lean on the fish. You combine that with a fast retrieve bait casting reel and the reason for the fast retrieve reel is you want to pick up line quickly to get the bait up and planing on the water to trigger the strike and when the fish bites you've got to have enough leverage to get the hook up and bring them in and out of the cover you know one neat thing about the uh a late summer fall period this cool water period when these bass get up and go like this is these fish will bite on a buzz bait all all day long, right in the middle of the day. Now, naturally, a little overcast like this is a plus. It's a little better than sun. But if you're fishing buzz baits uh, during a warm water period, like in summer, you know, the bite is all low light oriented. You know, it's early. You get a little spurt for an hour in the evening for an hour. But that's one of the beauties now. You can just throw all day long and they'll come up on it. In fact, some of the best fishing is right in the middle of the day. If you just take a look at the way that Al and I are covering this water, it's not just a bunch of nilly-willy casting. It may look like that to you, but believe me, we're a fine oiled machine. All kidding aside, I'm throwing the bait up extremely shallow, and Al is covering the outside edge. So when we go down an area, we've covered it. If there's a biter, an active fish, we're going to get a shot at him. Buzz baits are made in many styles. There are inlines, singles, and multiple bladed baits. Generally, in clear, calm water with sparse cover, a small, subtle, single-blade bait is a good choice. However, when fishing over dense cover in dark water or in windy conditions, cast a noisy, large, single-blade buzzer or a multiple-blade lure. Most hardcore buzzbait fishermen attach a trailer hook to the bait with a piece of surgical tubing to minimize short strikes. So, where do buzzbaits work best? They're exceptional baits for fishing over large flats of water weeds. Simply put the trolling motor on high and fan cast quickly, looking for aggressive biting bass. My kind of fish. Here, fishy fishy. Whoa! Man, Dan, you got some of them fish are so far They're up so in there. shallow. It's unbelievable. It's a pond. Oh boy, he was way up there. Oh, that. Oh, now he's in the <laughs> he's still in there? I see what looks like a body in there. He's not really big, but he buried me in the weeds. He gave me a run. Ain't that bad? Oh, he isn't bad. Oh. Man, was he buried. <laughs> well, there's the fish. You know what amazes me? Take a look at this contraption. A bunch of bent metal with a couple of blades on it. It puts out some really interesting vibrations and I would imagine some, some flash with the blade spinning and the color of the, of the skirt. 
Doesn't look like anything any self-respecting fish would eat. But bass are generalist feeders, and they're going to take advantage of something that looks vulnerable. You know, there's a tendency to fish a buzzbait or think a buzzbait only works in shallow water. And that isn't true. In fall like this, some of the best fishing that I've had, or some of the biggest bass that I've caught, as an example, have come in some reservoirs, buzzing, uh, buzzing bass out of the top of trees that were like, you know, five, eight, ten feet under the surface in 25 feet of water, and just these fish were suspended, and I'm running a buzz bait over it, and they blow up on it. In our natural lakes up north, oftentimes we hold out off of the weed line in like 20, 25 feet of water and throw the buzz bait out to the outer edges of the weed lines up on a flats and just run it out off of the edge, and sometimes the fish will hit over 15 feet of water. So, I mean, it isn't only a shallow water presentation, particularly in fall like this, early fall. You know, an interesting observation over the year, years that I've been chunking buzz baits around for bass, there's a lot of times I've seen clear water or clear conditions in the morning, as an example, you go back out and it'd be like uh, uh, crystal clear and sunny and bright, and it would be that way, oh, until 11 o'clock. And then all of a sudden, some good cloud banks would come in like we got behind us now. And uh, when that cloud bank comes in, even in the middle of the day, when those fish will all of a sudden turn on, where earlier when it was clear, they wouldn't quite break on a buzz bait. You know, you'd get them on a spinner bait or something else like that. But a cloud bank would come in, it haze up for 15, 20 minutes, and those fish would go to high percentage spot, bingo, they're up and on that buzzer like gangbusters. Well, they chase the bites. Boom! Got him? Yeah. Got him? Yeah. Yeah. Feels good, Dan. Oh, yeah. Whoa! Oh, she's a nice bass. You betcha. Oh, look at this. It's got one of those real neat black spots on his head. Halloweeno strip. You know what I call it? A beauty mark. You gonna jump one more time? Here, come here. Hey, one thing is certain about buzzing for bass. In addition to being effective, bigger than average fish hit these buzz baits at this time of the year. Actually, any time of the year. It's that squeak, Dan. I know it's the squeak. That's what turns them on. And it turns me on, too, when you can catch fish like this. Lure selection is primarily based on weed depth and composition. For example, a thick cattail wall would have to be flipped with a Texas rig worm or a jig and craw combination. The lily pad flat is rat and frog bait paradise. The expansive five-foot flats of mixed weeds is perfect buzzbait water. On the deeper flats, spinner baits and shallow lip crankbaits come into their own. The distinct deep edge is prime jigging or Texas rigging habitat. As you can see, each bait in your box has a time and a place where it's the best option. Crankbaits are some of the most universal lures available to anglers today. They're designed to catch everything from bluegills to billfish. These boys are hot! <laughs> Let's join Al and James Lindner with the fine points of rip cranking weeds right for bass. What size he is? Pretty good one. Looks good. Got him, got him. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Boy, I ripped through that deep mat of weeds and she was there, baby. And she was there. Oh, man. Boy, she ate it up good, Jim. Oh, boy, oh, come here. Look at that, she gobbled that sucker down. I think huh? you're gonna need some players for that, dude. Oh, yeah, I think so. Thank you. I appreciate the, the assistance. She looked to me like she was a hungry one. Look at that baby, huh? Nice bass. You know, when you think about largemouth bass like this and crankbaits, what comes to mind? When you look at a crankbait, you think about size, color, shape, lip design, all of these are factors 
that impact the bait's action. And depending on the kind of cover you're fishing, you want a different bait to do a different job. Today we're talking about crankbait and weeds, which is really an art in itself. It's a lot different than cranking open water or walking through wood. A lot different. And certain bait qualities work better than others. Right now we're fishing late summer and a lot of the uh, fish we're catching are actually set up on these main lake weed points and sunken islands. But earlier in the season, the fish probably would not be on spots like this. The fish would actually be up, backed up in these weed beds. As the season develops and the weed growth comes up, the fish gradually move out. You know, the best weeds normally are coontail, milfoil, and cabbage. These are the three types of weeds that you can crank through. A lot of the other weeds are actually junk weeds. And, and oh, are junk weeds, that was a bite are junk weeds and you can't crank bait through them. So those are the three main types of weeds. And this pattern, this crank and weed pattern for bass will hold all from uh, uh, early summer when the weeds just start to develop and start getting pretty thick, all the way to late summer, early fall where they start to shrink down and start to die off. So I mean, it's a long, long calendar period depending on where you're at in the country that you could do this. And it's usually Stable weather works best when the fish are higher in these weed beds. When you get bad fronts or something, they'll go down into the weeds and naturally then you go to a flipping a jig or a Texas rig bait into the weeds for the bass. So stable weather like we've got today, hot, a little muggy. You can see these bluegills breaking all over the surface, bait up high, ideal conditions for this. A lot of our northern natural lakes up here in Minnesota, actually all the way across the Midwest, you have a lot of uh, lakes that have giant weed beds in them. And it takes a little bit of work to find fish on these giant weed beds. Crankbaiting is so efficient to cover these in a relatively short order, which is really key because it can take some time, amount of time if you got to catch them with a slower technique. Got There's a one. Big, yep. big fish. Oh. Boy, but when they're hot. They're active. Out. Boy, you get those baits and come ripping it across them. I mean, I got this, this storm magwort. I mean, it sounds like a maraca. And it really calls those real active fish up immediately. Boy, they get right on the bait. The fish will travel a distance to literally find the lure. Oh, boy. it's one thing I really got them here. <laughs> I know, every one of them, I got them re hooked really good the way you want them hooked in a tournament like that. <laughs> then they're Real hooked. noisy lure. But the thing is, is these fish are at, when they're up, they're actually uh, moving around, they're actively hunting. They're up trying to find food and you make that much noise and pull it across, the, the active fish will find you. Oh yes, yeah, huh? yeah. Oh, oh, nice fish, man. Oh, boy, that was a nice one. Ooh. Ooh. Where did he come from? He should have some You buddies. came right around the corner at that point. Point, yeah. You know where she said, was at. Boy, she swung in. I should have had that one. You Thanks. can see that this is that milfoil clump. It's about 12 foot deep at the base. It's about four or five feet at the top. And we're just trying to get that lure to skip and ricochet. And you just try to clip to the tops of those types of weeds right there. You're perfect now. This is about right, right. I can throw down this side. You're gonna should get a fish here. Ah, buried in there. That one I couldn't break free of, but that's that's what it's all about. Most of the time you can break free of, free of it if you're walking it right. But I mean, if you ain't catching weeds like this and pulling through this stuff, you ain't catching fish. The majority of the strikes, not all of them, but a good percentage of them come as soon as that crankbait breaks free off of that weed, bang, that fish is there. And uh, a lot of times when you get a high percentage spot after you found them, say they're on the tip of a point or the inside pocket of a flat. Uh, numerous casts to an area. You know, you want to fish through everything. The thing that covers kind of tight and those fish can be tucked down in those weeds. So I mean, you just don't blow through it. You really systematically make your cast through there to get the majority of those biters. Are you going to go back around it? No, I'm just I'm going to just tighten up to the point and then slide down this this Does, way. This back side a little? Yeah. Oh, there. Oh, oh, there's a big boy. Oh, oh. Oh, <laughs> oh boy, he's got me burrowed down yet? in there. It's one thing. To, 
is the rod that you fish right now. We're rip cranking and we're using actually relatively stiff rods in comparison to what a lot of crankbait fishermen would normally fish with. Look Ooh, at that nice guy. One. She's in there. Yeah, right in the weeds. Get all the weeds off there. The rod really necessitates how to fish the bait through the weeds. Right now we're fishing with a uh, bait called a, sto a storm magwort. And this bait probably runs about three to four feet down depending on how fast you pull it. But what we're doing is throwing it over flats where the weeds come up within three to four feet of the surface. And what we're trying to do is actually get the bait to just tickle the tops of the weeds. But when you dig into a heavier clump, you give it a rip. And a lot of times that's when you trigger these boys into biting. Now I'm gonna need that pliers again. There you go. Seems like there's a school of them on this point yeah, here. There, man. there we go. Not a big boy, but there's some big ones on this point. Right now I'm using actually a, a pretty fast action rod with 17 pound test mono. And if you were fishing a softer rod, what happens, the whole rod will just load up into the weeds and you won't be able to rip the bait clean of the weeds, which is the real key to the weed fishing with crankbaits. You get on schools of them and see how you just you just hit those weeds, reel the bait down when it starts tickling through the top, you give it a pop and just shear off those weed clumps. Personally, I like uh, for this kind of fishing, I think most most people that do a lot of it would agree that it's much easier with a bait casting rod than a spinning rod. Can you do it with a spinning rod? I guess you could. But given the choice, you know, a bait casting rod is way, way, way more efficient. I like to fish the bait actually with the rod. You know, you know where I pull the bait, I'm picking up the slack line with the reel, and then, but I'm actually pulling the bait that way. I, as soon as I feel that weed, a lot of times I just stop. I have a little more control by fishing a bait with the rod instead of the reel. It just works a little better for me in these conditions. You can actually see the shape of the point we're fishing right here. It's a big, just a dog leg arm sticking off a shore drop here. And the weeds up on top is probably about maybe four or five foot on top. And it, the weeds actually go, grow down to as deep as probably 14 foot of water off the deeper edges of this thing. And so what we're doing is we're pitching that bait up slowly reeling it down and walking it down the depth of the weeds as the depth of the contour comes down. I like to fish that rod like, to the side like this. I actually am pumping it. That way when I make contact with the weeds, sometimes I'll let that buoyant bait or float back out and then I rip it back down again. When you hook it, you hook weeds like that, you can often rip through it. That big lip, it makes a huge difference. It's amazing when you get to the right rhythm to fish in a bait like this, how much, how heavy of weed cover you could fish that crankbait too through when it's the right bait, you know, the right shape. And it takes some, it takes a, oh, did, did you see that rod tip just set up there for a second? He grabbed it again and then, that was another hit. There, got him that time. You got him. Yeah, good one, that one. Oh, yeah. Come on up, baby. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> that fish went twice. You boom, boom. The whole bait is gone down uh, the throat. Oh, there was another one. There was another bass Are with that one. Me? There was another one with him. He wants a. Oh, I, man. I got something for him. You got something for yeah, him? Yeah, I do. Oh, I got to land this sucker. Oh, She's too yeah, big to be that. thinking with. Huh? Ooh, uh, got one hook on her. Come here, big mama. I got her. Just want to show you to the camera and we'll put you right back. Beautiful bass. Look at that. I had another hit just before that. I wonder if that wasn't her. That is a honker, isn't it? That is a honker. You know, when you're thinking about cranking, picking crankbaits for bass and weeds, here's some of the key things to keep in mind. You want a big fat bait. Look at that thing, a big round fat bait. Very buoyant. You want a bait that'll back back out of the weeds. Buoyancy is key, shape is key. Look at that lip. It's not a skinny, thin lip. It's a real wide lip. That's a key factor. Listen to that. You want a bait that makes a lot of noise, a real wide wobble. These are some of the key qualities to picking a crankbait. 
when you're fishing them in weeds. I really believe one of the most important facets of crankbait fishing is, is actually lure choice for the conditions or the habitat you're fishing. You'll look at our crankbaits boxes, you'll notice that we have five different boxes of all varying different lips and different designs, and each one of those lures have a real specific condition where those baits work right. Looking at a large underwater weed flat, you can see why individual lures are needed to fish the varying depth zones between the surface and the tops of the weeds. For example, on the shallowest portion of this weed flat, where the weeds come within two feet of the surface, a shallow lip short wart runs at the right depth. In the five foot zone, a magnum wiggle wart would be a good option. Over the eight foot weeds, a deep diving risto wrap would run at the right depth level to clip the top of the weeds. Good crankbait fishermen usually have a variety of baits rigged on different rods to cover the varying depth zones they're fishing over. You know, you don't have to sit here and make real long casts. A lot of times people want to take these crankbaits and throw them as far as the rod and reel will allow you to do it. When you're fishing particularly these deep edges like this, the more casts you make in that strike zone, when in this case, the high weeds near the drop off, the more fish you're going to catch. Just, we're actually making fairly short casts. We already matched the size and the depth of the bait to the top of the weed, so we're matched right for the conditions. So we're actually making a lot of short, precise casts instead of real long casts. It's just keeping a bait in the high percentage spots the majority of the time. Keep the rod tip high up on top, but as we get closer to the boat, I'll just drop it down to get a little bit better depth as you get out in a little bit deeper water here. There he is, another one. Right out Ooh, of the way. Nice look one. at that. Big horsey, too. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Beauty. Look at the size of that guy. Look at that. As soon as it tore off the deep edge, there he was. That fish, the bait just hesitated for a second or two when it clipped the weeds, and she just launched it. Look at that. There's some real big boys here. Come here. I'll tell you one thing, rip cranking weeds is a phenomenally effective technique for catching big bass out of weeds. Get this big boy back in the water. Ooh, got him, Dan. Eric, she's coming up. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's one of those good bass, yeah, Al. Nice, nice fish. Nice fish. Just, just sat there and thunk that water pretty cool. Boy, did she gobble that blade. Holy smokes. Oh, come here, baby. Boy, did she eat that thing up. Gobbled, gobbled that bait big time. That's a there. good hook. Huh? That's a good bass. You know, you know, spinner baits and bass like this go hand in hand. Bunches of bunches of fish taken on spinner baits every, every single year. Hey, if you go for largemouth bass, you don't ever go out on the water without a spinner bait tied on a rod. It works all year long. It produces fish in all kinds of water. Now, most bass fishing with a spinner bait is done in shallow water, fairly shallow water. Let's say uh, probably six foot or less. And there's no question that that's effective in shallow water like that. But there's a time and a place that fishing a spinner bait like this is really productive in deep water, say six. 10, 18, as deep as 20 feet, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Deep water spinner bait fishing for big dogs. Oh, got a big one. You got another one? Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. Dear. You know, we're catching fish out of two kinds of conditions. Some of them are real steep breaks where the walls are falling and, and we're helicoptering those, those fish out of there. And then we're getting up on these scattered weed flats, which up on these northern lakes, these bass will get on and really actually winter in some of these areas. I'm talking to these, these mats, these flats are eight, 10 feet of water with clumps of coontail and milfoil all over them. And if I had to pick one key spot to roll these spinner baits, that's it. 
I mean, it's always got some fish. Oh, this does look good, Al. Oh, boy, I'm telling you, we're really into some hot water here. See him? I'm going to catch him. There he is, Al. Finally. That one was deep. I really slowed down a lot like you did, and really, she's up on top. Whoa, another good fish. I really slowed down that retrieve. I think I got a little hyper, too many cups of coffee. And when you get fish in deep water, this longer rod is real important to setting hooks and getting the fish up and out of the cover. Just look at this, yeah, that's another good one. <laughs> wow, I love this. Another giant bass fall flat rolling spinner baits. Okay, there you go. Like most presentations, your choice of equipment for catching bass under these situations is very important. We like bait casting equipment. Use at least a six and a half foot, maybe even a seven or seven and a half foot bait casting rod in a medium to medium heavy action. We happen to be using Quantum Tour Edition bait casting outfits teamed with a Quantum bait casting reel. And the line is also important. Depending on your cover conditions, a 14 to 20 pound test line is appropriate. And we're using Berkley XT or Berkley Sensithin. It has less stretch and allows you to feel the blade as it thumps along the bottom and detects subtle strikes. So this is some of the best water I've seen. You get that high afternoon sun, you can see these pockets better. Oh, pumping it. Oh, yeah. Whoa, look at that thing, Al. Oh, big bass. She was in 15 foot of water out here. Oh, big fish. Yeah, she was big fish. Oh, man. Big, giant fish. <sighs> wow, Dan. Look at that. She can barely get out with that cold water, boy. She's doing all she can to break that surface. But that's a heck of a big body to try to get out of the water. Whew. That is a big bass. Look at that. You know, one thing about fishing these cold water periods, these cool to cold water periods like this, you get bigger than average fish. Some of the biggest fish of the year are taken at this time. You know, it isn't uncommon to be able to catch uh, deep water bass on a spinnerbait all year long. But from our experience, there's no question that the fall period, like we're fishing now, when you're coming out of a cool water environment, going into a cold water environment, I'm talking water temperatures of about 58, dropping all the way down, as far down as 45 degrees. Depending on where you're at in the country, you can get some big, big fish, slow rolling or jigging these spinner baits on deep structures. Then again in spring, when you're coming out of the cool water of winter and slowly going into the warmer water, uh, where, where your water temperatures are, say, uh, a 45 going on up to about 57, 58. These are the two periods of time where these really big, big fish get on these spinner baits in a big way. Some of the best trophy fishing of the year is in these time frames. There's a couple different retrieves that you could use to, to fish these baits real easy down in deep, deep water. What we're fishing here now is a weed wall, and I mean it falls quite sharp vertically. It goes from about four to almost 18 feet of water real sharp. And what we're doing, we're throwing right up on top of the break, right on top of those weeds. You're holding the line taut, but not quite, quite tight where you could watch the line going down, because a lot of times as it's helicoptering, you'll feel that fish go thunk. And I'm fishing it almost like a jig. It's hitting bottom, I'm lifting, I'm pumping it up like that, and letting it go, I'm following it back down and letting it helicopter down that drop off. The other retrieve is if you're more spread across a flat, say you're in an eight or 10 or 12 foot flat and it's got clumps of weeds or stumps or bushes, you cast it out, you leave the bait sink all the way to the bottom, snap your rod to engage the reel and then just slowly turn the reel handle. When I'm fishing like this, I like to keep the rod tip real close to the water and all you're doing is reeling it just slow and steady, and as soon as you can come into a bush or, or some weeds, you'll feel the spinner lock up. You just kind of pop it through and stop and let it flutter again, and bang, that's when you'll get your hit. But those are the two basic retrieves, and uh, the main thing to keep in mind is it is slow. For a spinner bait, 
it's real slow. Just enough to make that blade turn. There he is. Oh, that. Oh, that's a good one, too. I got one, too. You got one? Yeah. Yes, oh, I do. Oh, they're both good fish. Oh, look at this. Oh, boy, that, that was that was a, a good find. Dan, let me just spin the boat around so I don't pull up on that spot and pull us out here. One thing about this time of the year, when you get into these fish, you can get into schools of them, that's for sure. You know, doubles are not rare. You can get into one mat of weeds and go thunk, thunk, thunk. How big is yours? Better, Al. Better, both of them about the same size. Yeah. And they're really bulking up now. Getting yeah. to be cold water time. One thing we like to do with our spinner baits is we like to bulk them up. And you can put a piece of plastic or a piece of pork, and what it'll do, it'll allow the bait to fall a lot slower. Typically, people will fish spinner baits and cast them out and crank them in, and that's a very effective way to do it when the water's warmer. You can literally bulge a spinner bait, you can fish it at mid depths, or you can slow roll it like we're doing. And part of the trick in this cooler to colder water situation is bulking the bait up so when then you drop it on a taut line, it vertically flutters. When we prefer to use the single spins, and it gives a, a big profile, which the bass seem to prefer at this time of the year, and also allows you to fish extremely slowly and effectively cover water. Nice one. That's what we're looking for, Al. A little bit better one there, Dan. A little bit better. Maybe I should hit almost, almost by the boat. I was just kind of jigging that spinner bait real slow, which is one good presentation for this time of the year. I do like that pork on a back day in and day out in these cold water conditions. You know, you tip that sucker with pork, and it, it's a deadly, deadly combination. You know, we're fishing a new spinner bait by Blue Fox, and it's got one of these neat wrinkle, uh, what do they call it, these titanium shafts, which is really slick. It never gets out of tune. It works really well. So when you look at a bait like this, what makes it up? Naturally, the weight of the head is important. A little bit of the uh, color of the skirt. Blades are key, real key. And this particular, see this little spring thing here? It makes changing your blades, blade sizes, and blade colors a snap. Spinner baits are really a versatile lure in which the blade configuration and retrieve speed can dictate where and how the bait functions best. Basically, a double Colorado style is a good shallow water bait. A Colorado and Willow combination is a good mid-depth range bait, while a single Colorado is the best option for deep water situations like we're fishing today. This new Blue Fox Titanium has a unique wire arm bend, which enables you to change all the blade components in seconds, giving you the ability to quickly experiment with different blade sizes, styles, and colors. Oh, Not man. another one, Al! Yeah. Oh. One more jump. It's all it takes to get him out of there. Look at that. Yes, sir. Doop. Look at how you've been eating that spinnerbait. My gosh, boy, look at that. I mean, they're gobbling that whole thing. Really gobbling it, Dan. Those ain't light, light takers, boy. Huh? There's no question, slow rolling them spinner baits in deep water. You want a trophy fish, this is the time of the year to do it, and probably day in and day out, one of the, the best presentations. Confidence level's going up. <laughs> All fish make seasonal movements based on some very definable factors, and chief among them is food. The availability and type of prey within all waters ultimately dictate how, where, and why fish move. Let's join Al Linder with a revealing look at the predator-prey relationship and how it can determine the best lure choices. Been some big fish right in here. The next next hundred hundred foot has had some biggies in here, like that one. Oh yes. Oh, what a nice one. He just pounded that skitter pop. 
Let's see. Is she gonna come up and give me a jump? Oh, nice fish, nice fish. Oh, I love it. I love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. <laughs> I missed the first one just a minute ago, and this one flat got on it perfectly. Absolutely perfectly. Look at that. Oh, a couple hooks in her, correct though? Uh huh? You know, bass like this in any body of water really have, I guess, what we would call preferred forage. Naturally, they'll eat whatever is available or abundant, but there is things they prefer. Some bodies of water, it's shad. Other bodies of water, it's crawdads. And in a lot of systems, it's bluegills. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about a bass-bluegill relationship, a pattern that happens all over the country and lasts for a long time. It's a fun way to catch bass and zero in on a system that a lot of people just don't take advantage of as regularly as they could or should. Oh, yes. Oh, it's a good, oh, a big, big one again. Man, did he eat that thing. Did he ever eat it? I don't know how good he's hooked. I got, I got to take it a little easier with him. Oh, he's got a couple of hooks in him. He's got a couple hooks across his face. I don't have to be real careful with him. I can just kind of lift him in. <laughs> you didn't trick me, did you, huh? You know, this bass bluegill topwater pattern really lasts quite a while. It's a long, long time that this happens. Uh, it'll start It'll start around uh, about two weeks after the bluegills get off the beds, which tend to coincide with the weed growth spreading out to the weed line. Uh, it just kind of happens that way perfectly. God made a good plan in that relationship. So when this happens, a couple weeks after the gills get off the beds, you can start to see these gills get on these deep weed lines and that top water bite and the bass will be hand in hand. They're gonna be right behind them. And it'll go all the way into late summer, into early fall. As the water starts to cool off, it'll become less and less productive. But that can be a long, long, long period of time, depending on where you live in a country. And uh, there's so many lakes that the number one forage throughout most of the year is bluegills. I happen to be on one of these lakes now. So this pattern really is effective, not to mention fun. Oh boy, that's a good one. Ooh, what did he hit that thing? Holy moly. Good fish. Ooh. Oh, 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 there she comes. Oh boy, that's a good one. Look at it down in that clear water, boy. You can see her so far down there. Look at that one. Oh, she, she, oh, she just tore off. Oh, man. You know, I don't know if you were able to see in that clear water the bait was down on the side of her face. Yeah, you know, I should, have, I should have played her a little bit easier. You know what's interesting? When people think about throwing topwater baits like this, what comes to mind is normally low light conditions in shallow water. And granted, that's a good time to, do, to be doing this, but that's not what I'm doing now. I'm actually out, it's early afternoon, and uh, when you fish a bluegill, uh, a bluegill bass bite like we're fishing here, it's a clear water environment, the bluegills are suspended out off of the deep weed line. I'm catching these fish in 15 to 18 feet of water. The weed line is about 12 feet and the bluegills are suspended real high. When this happens, and it happens a long portion of, of, of the, the season in lakes that you have bass and bluegills in, they'll get on this topwater bite and on days with a little bit of haze like this, you can catch them all day long. In fact, some of the best fishing I've ever had is in the middle of the day. So you don't necessarily have to zero in on that early and late bite. You can catch these fish, topwater fishing, all day long in these conditions, and some big fish. See these pods of bait here? Those bass are laying high. That could be a bass there. And those pods of bluegill. And I know those fish are coming up for this bait out here off of eight feet, or, you know, eight feet down. You know, you can tell a lot of the mood of the fish on a topwater bait, the way they're hitting the bait. When they're exploding, up on a bait and really blowing up on it and you have no problem hooking them like they are today, 
They're real aggressive. They're coming from deep water, running up to the bait and not hesitant, and they're blowing up on a bait or coming from a distance away to hit it. That means you can fish faster, cover more water quicker, be a little more aggressive, you cover more water. Uh, if they're sucking the bait, where you'll sometimes see them in this clear water, you'll see them come under the bait and they'll look at it, then they'll come up and sometimes they'll take it and they'll just, just barely suck it down. When they're like that, you gotta slow down and leave the bait sit for a long, long time to call them up. Let me give you kind of a guide to topwater baits. When, where, how, and why. It'll help you catch more fish. There's a lot of good topwater baits on the market today. For deep weed fishing situations, I tend to use larger profile lures that call fish from the depths. Interestingly, each type of topwater bait has qualities that work when others won't. Prop baits are the best lures to use when you have some amount of chop on the water. In clear, calm water situations, chuggers like a skitter pop fished with long pauses can trigger the most tentative bass. The erratic nature of a jump bait tends to produce bigger bass than normal. It's vitally important to experiment with different types of baits, retrieve speeds, and length of pauses. One thing on this bluegill bass pattern that we're talking about, it is most effective in clear water. I mean, I've done this for years on so many different kind of lakes, and I'll tell you, when you get in dark, dark water environments, even though it could have a good population of bluegills in it, it doesn't work the same. This top water bite over this deep water does not work the same as it does in clear water. The clearer the water, the more consistent the bite is. You know, fish in top water baits in clear water environments like this actually started in Florida with these propeller type baits buku years ago. But that's the Florida fishermen in these real clear water uh, phosphate pits and clear water lakes in Florida many years ago that these guys started fishing these, these propeller type baits over deep grass areas like this catching big, big bass. You know, so this is nothing new, but what, where it is new, I'll tell you where it really is. It's up north here where I do a lot of fishing. Boy, you see very, very few anglers taking advantage of this topwater bluegill bass relationship. Very few. Most guys are fishing under the fish. They're throwing cranks, they're rolling spinner baits, they're flipping jigs and worms, missing out on some tremendous fishing. What you do is look, you, a lot of these days, these warm muggy days like today, it was 88 today, you get out and you see these bluegills all over the surface. You see little pods of bluegills and you see fish, you'll see them flush like this. When that happens, that's bass rushing through them. That's your indicator, boy. Get that topwater bait out. Got him. Oh, yeah. Good one, too. Oh, ho, ho, ho. that was a slurper. He's going to come up. Look at the size of that one. Ho, ho. You talk about a piggy. He's going to come up again. Look at this. Oh, man. Every one of them is a good bass. Every single one of them. Look at that clear water. I can see that fish 10 feet down coming up. Look at that. Huh? Oh, boy, what a beauty. What a beauty. Oh, huh? Look at that. <laughs> little change up. I came through her before, and she didn't want that skitter pop. She says, I want a prop bait. Hey, there was absolutely no question that topwater fishing is exciting. But I'll tell you what, in a lot of conditions, a lot of circumstances, it's the best thing you can be chunking. And when we're talking about suspended bluegills off of weed lines, that's one of those circumstances. It's a pattern that'll put a lot of big fish in your boat, and not many people are doing it. Understanding changes in the bass's feeding attitude is important no matter where they swim. Really active bass tend to move out of thick weed growth into sparse weed pockets or onto points and edges to hunt down food. Hot fish will travel a distance to literally run down Whoa. forage. Horizontal baits like buzz baits, spinner baits, and crank baits are invaluable tools for combing large weed flats. Vertical baits, like jigs and worms, are good baits for extracting fish from distinct weed edges and heavy weed clumps that tend to gather bass that are in a more neutral to negative feeding mood. 
Anglers have to deal with varying weather conditions every day they're on the water. By late today, we'll see the first bad cold snap of the season slipping in from Canada. Conditions will be cold and windy. Cold fronts are generally considered a bane to anglers. The fish just aren't biting, they say. Oh, Little fish. do they realize, nope. cold fronts oh, can actually nice concentrate fish, fish in very well, specific spots. Let's join Al and James yeah, Lindner with some insights for coping with the cold front blues. That is a good one. I seen a deep mat of weeds there. You know, and, and as you went around it, I started dragging. I flipped that Texas rig down in that stuff. That's what they're living down in. And I was just kind of sitting there, almost dead sticking it, almost straight vertical. You know, we're fishing the worst cold front of the summer. It's uh, middle of July, July 17th. And I'll tell you, for the last, oh, probably three weeks, it's been going anywhere from 80 to pushing 90 degrees almost every day. Water got up to about 82, 83 degrees. That's warm. Last night, a front come through. It got into the low 40s. Tonight, it might even hit 38 degrees is what they're talking. When fronts like this hit, you can see these mild high skies. Bass fishing or any kind of fishing naturally gets tough, but there's a few things you can do, particularly in weed lakes, that'll help you catch some bass, and sometimes some pretty big fish. The last couple of days, it was beautiful. It was 80 degrees, sunny, warm, and stable, and these fish were biting all over. The fish were spread out. You'd come along here, and you'd see bluegills all over along these deep weed edges right up on the surface. But since that cold front hit, what happens, those fish are actually pushed down, and then generally what they'll do is gather on very specific, thickest weed clumps along the weed edge. So it takes a little bit of time to find those fish, but once you do, you can have incredible fishing during what most people would consider very tough fishing. When you make contact in one of these weed mats like I'm in now, you don't actually kind of break, I'm sitting right in there, I'm just kind of shaking and dancing that rod, dancing and dancing. I don't want to pull it through real fast. And if you can picture those fish, they're just coming up. They feel it pulling on the weeds. They feel it. They get curious enough. They just come up and they're looking, looking, looking at it. And finally, one of them will grab it. I mean, you really do slow down when you get in one of those high percentage areas and just work that piece. Work it, work it, work it. Sort of interesting, actually. We were here about a week ago, and the fish were spread out all over this uh, point. And since this cold front came through, a lot of the fish have actually shifted in what they are. They're actually positioned along the sharpest drop off, where the deep water cuts in closest to the wall of weeds. And that's really common in cold front conditions. Al, I'm going to spin back around off the tip again. It seems like they're oh. back in there. Oh, you know what that was? One of those toothy One of those toothy critters. That'll bit happen. My, bit my jig off. Well, you work back through there. Another thing to keep in mind when you're fishing frontal conditions like this, you cannot fish real fast. Now you know you, you might have a, a, a 20 foot dense patch of weeds. You fish it and you fish it and you fish it. There could be 25, 30 big bass laying there and every once in a while one of them will turn on. You really got to fish slow, really fish precise and just deep flip. Every little pocket and hole that you see in there, the fish will not chase. So I mean you got to hit them right on the tip of the nose for him to bite. Ooh, right below the boat. Ooh, ooh he spit your bait out. <laughs> Boy, beautiful fish, look at that guy there. Popping the jig, yeah, popping Yeah, real it. heavy one. Look at that. A little better, a little better buddy. fish. Ooh, look at the size look at of that guy. A lot better, look at the belly, nice looking fish. Beautiful fish, good one. You know, when it comes to tough conditions like this, and you gotta get down in heavy cover to flip those bass out. There's, it's really simple. There's two baits that come into play. A jig, a heavy jig that penetrates that stuff, or a really heavy duty Texas rigged uh, a worm. I'm throwing a, a probably a three quarter ounce head. Here, in fact, it is a three quarter ounce. He's flipping a three quarter ounce jig. But a, a heavy Texas rigged piece of plastic or a jig, and, and that's the two best cold front baits for tough conditions, you can drop in these weeds. There is no better bait, pure and simple. Ooh, there's one. Not a bad one. 
bad one. There we go. Come here, buddy. Nice fish. You know, just about any time you're really deep weed line fishing, what you're better off to do is very short, concise cast. We're actually moving along the, uh, the deep weed edge, and I'm watching with the depth finder, actually looking for the end, the absolute end of the deepest weeds and making just short pitches into just slightly up, maybe 10, 15 feet into the weeds, and then actually out past the edge of the weeds. Just a sheer wall of weeds. That's actually a weed clump, a very dense uh, coontail. Looks almost like it's not the bottom, but like a, almost a table. But you can see how deep those weeds, those weeds actually come up within five feet of the surface, and we're in 12 foot of water. Oh, Jim. What do you got there? Uh, I got a, Ooh, a nice bass. Go. I got a nice bass. Yeah. You know, it's really important when you're fishing this kind of stuff, this heavy, heavy stuff, to have heavy equipment. I mean, you gotta have it or you ain't gonna get these, these fish out of here. You know, you know, minimum a 17 pound test, minimum. And, and if you're in, in real heavy cover with real big bass, you know, 30 isn't, isn't out of the question. A lot of times, the strike when you're fi when these fish are negative like this, actually the, the bait you hardly feel. All you feel is the bait just stops, like that one. Looks Ooh, good. Looks that good. Looks like a better one there. Ooh, oh that man! Whoa! That's a big one. Whoa. That's a big one, Bubba. Oh! That's a big one, Jimmy. Keep me off them weeds in case I'm he's got a buddy there. <laughs> Look at the bubbles. I mean, this Boy, that's putting a horse. bubbles like a lake trout. That's that a horse, is a man. big bass. Wow. That's a horse. Look at the size of that boy. Ooh. Ooh. Come here. Ooh, I got one too. I thought she was bigger than that for a second. And it was right on that wall. Right boy, on we the just wall. pulled off of it. That was that one you were looking at, talking yeah. about how nice it looked. It's, it's unbelievable, you know. We have really brutal conditions. The worst cold front of the summer we probably had in probably two months. And look what you can catch. The thing is, get heavy, get vertical and find the heaviest clumps of weeds, and it produced big bass. Look at the size of that thing. We'll get her back in the water. As we've seen, to be an effective grass fisherman, you have to be a very, very versatile angler. Seasonally, the bass move a lot based on factors like forage and changing weed composition. Choosing the appropriate lure depends on how the weeds are laid out and the bass's present feeding attitude. And that attitude can change dramatically over the course of the day. The ticket to catching bass consistently is simply the angler's ability to match the right bait for the given situation. Time spent on the water will eventually enable you to simply look at the conditions and make the right choice. Back in the water, look at the size of that. 